three, two, one. And this is also a central problem of atheism. It's just a very simple thing that zero plus zero plus zero can never give you one, right? So just the question of why do we come from something? Why do we exist, right? And I was actually thinking about this when you, you earlier when you were talking about God, you said that he's the necessary existent, right? In Arabic, it's what's called al-wajib al-wujud, which literally means like the necessary existent. And in Islamic logic, and this is the same in Greek logic, there are three categories of existence. The first is that of necessary existence. Like if I exist, right, it's necessary that I come from like a mother and a father, right? I can't just spring into existence, right? So because of my existence, it's necessary that my mother exists. And then the other category of existence is contingent existence, where it's like the existence of something is contingent on another thing. And the classic example of this is like, if you turn on like a TV or like a TV is like going off in front of you, like that is contingent on electricity, right? If electricity stops, that TV stops existing. And human beings, our existence is contingent. We have other people who bring us into existence. And then the third category of existence is what's called impossible or incoherent existence. In Arabic, the word is mustahil, right? Which literally means like impossible. But some people call it like incoherent. And the example of this is like a four-sided triangle, right? Like, have you ever heard like the, the idea of they'll be like, oh, could God create a four-sided triangle, right? Yeah and, yeah, and if God can't create a four-sided triangle, then he's not all being all powerful. Yeah. The Islamic logicians would say the issue of this isn't God's power, but the issue with this is the, the phrase itself is incoherent because a triangle is by definition something with three sides. So four-sided, three-sided thing. Like you're just not saying like anything coherent. <laughs> yeah. I've struggled with this par paradox for a long time. I'm glad you, you solved it for me. Uh -huh. How is it more logical for us to believe in a God uh -huh. th than not to believe in a God? Uh -huh. So from the Kalam cosmological argument, we can ascertain this idea that um, there has to be some uncreated like something at the beginning, right? And previously, when people were kind of committed to the system of Aristotle and Plato, it says that the world was uncreated. But the Qur'an like always contradicted that. And this was something that Islamic philosophers actually like struggled with, right? Because the dominant thinking in society was that the world was uncreated. But the Qur'an says something like very much like the opposite of that. So a lot of Islamic philosophers would actually interpret the Qur'an, the Qur'anic verses regarding the universe springing into existence and having a beginning in kind of this kind of weird roundabout way where they would interpret it in a way that kind of dances around what's like actually being said. And uh, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, who is a very famous Islamic theologian who dies in the year 1111, he very much writes this kind of refutation of these people. And he says that, like, no, it's mandatory for Muslim to believe that God brought, like, the universe into existence, right? And in the early 20th century, the dominant mode of thinking in society very much changes with something like the Big Bang Theory and, like, all of this sort of stuff. And now it's essentially agreed upon by everybody that the universe has a beginning and it has something else that brought it into existence and even like these verses of surah tur people said that you know this is th these verses are talking to human beings but you can apply it to the universe and there are four possibilities for how the universe came about the universe could come from nothing the universe could come from a created universe the universe could be a self-created universe or the universe could come from like an uncreated being. And earlier we addressed the idea of why a universe from a created universe can exist, right? Because something would have to create that universe, something would have to create that universe, something would have to create that universe. And then you have this issue of infinite regress, right? You can't have an infinite chain of causes. Similar to like the example I gave where if I wanna hand you my phone and I say I'm gonna give it to inf infinity people, then I'm gonna give it to you, you're never gonna get that phone because infinity never ends, right? So we know the universe couldn't have come from a created universe that came from a created universe. You can't have that infinite sea of causes. The universe can't be self-created because for the universe to be self-created, it would both have to exist and not exist at the same time, right? And that's impossible. In a similar way, like our mothers couldn't have given birth to themselves, right? Just like imagine that in your head, it's just impossible, right? So we know we can't have a universe from a created universe and we know we can't have a universe that was self-created. And a universe from nothing, no one has really argued this. There's one person by the name of Lawrence Krauss. He's kind of like this like atheist like I physicist. Yeah. 
So he has a book called A Universe from Nothing. And the first chapter of the book is called Nothing is Something. So it's more of like an argument of like linguistics as opposed to an argument of actually believing that nothing was there. Like he also believes in an uncreated being at like the beginning, but his uncreated being is what's called the vacuum, what's called the quantum vacuum, where it's this sea of fluctuating matter. But the sea of fluctuating matter in the beginning, it still poses the question of what created that sea of fluctuating matter, right? So it's either you believe there is a sea of fluctuating matter at the beginning, um, and something had to bring that into existence, or you believe in kind of like an uncreated kind of being, right? This kind of like first cause. And then there are also other questions, right? In philosophy, we have what's known as a hard problem of consciousness. This idea of what does it mean to be conscious? If I were to kind of eat an apple, no one can really know what it is like for me to kind of eat that apple. Or if you were to eat an apple, it's a very like subjective feeling. Like me and you, we could have the same chemicals going off in our bodies when we eat this apple, but there's like something else there. And people haven't really been able to like identify what that is. Like material things are never able to like identify that. So from the hard problem of consciousness, we can also ascertain from this uncreated being, right? If conscious beings were able to come about later, we know from observing the universe that the only thing that can create conscious beings are other conscious beings. We came into existence from parents who are conscious, right? Who had this awareness, something that makes them different from like this table, right? So if I'm just a collection of, you know, material parts, and this table is a collection of material parts, I have something that this other thing doesn't have. And a lot of theists would say that this is the idea of like soul. It's actually interesting, Islamically, there hasn't been much to like my knowledge that where Islamic philosophers have actually talked about, or like theologians have talked about what the soul is, like the nature of the soul. Whereas in Western philosophy, you have a lot of talk about the nature of the soul. Like they'll even talk about like, where is the soul. In Islamic Why theology... Is that? In Islamic theology, we don't focus on it. I think in Islamic theology, another thing about Islamic theology is that it's kind of like less action-based and more kind of like... Pondering? Being-based, you could say. Like in Western philosophy, you also have these quandaries where it's like, oh, let's say I'm running a train and the train is about to kill five people, but if I turn it, it'll kill two people instead. Is it immoral for me to turn it because then I consciously killed two people? Or am I reducing harm? Like stuff like that, right? In Muslims, we never had like... Like, our ethics weren't based on actions, but it was based on, like, something else. What is it based on? What's that something else? One of it is intention, right? Like, the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, um, which is probably the most popular book of sayings of the Prophet Muhammad the first thing in the book is actions are judged upon their intentions, right? So intentionality is important. Like, all of these other things are taken into account, right? So if someone is driving a train... Like, we need to know about this person. We need to know where they're at in life. We need to know about their intentions. We need to know more about them, that they're driving a train and it's going to go this way or that way. So it's a, a little bit more complicated. So similarly, with the idea of the soul, Islamic philosophers, their questions were more, what do we do with this soul? How do you purify this soul? All of this sort of stuff. Whereas in Western philosophy, there seems to be a lot of this talk of where is the soul? What is the soul? The nature of the soul. But going back to this argument for the existence of God, using this idea of consciousness, we can assume that this being at the beginning was conscious. And then there are other attributes that we can like derive from that. But the central problem of atheism is this conundrum of how do you figure out how we came to be and why there was something rather than nothing. The idea of a God very readily resolves that issue. And other kind of things that have tried to resolve that issue have made it very, very difficult to do so. So what, are, what if I tell you that there's billions of planets, trillions of planets, and trillions of stars? So isn't it just a matter of probability that there was going to end up a perfect planet that had the perfect chemicals and microbiomes that came together, all the perfect events happening to form this thing called life? I could just tell you, hey, man, this is just a matter of probability out of trillions, like one in a trillion probability that life exists. That's why logically life exists without God. It's uh -huh. just a matter of probability within the universe. But then it's a question of what caused those billions of planets to exist? What caused like all of these sorts of things? That would be a sort of response to the fine tuning argument that basically argues that the probability of our universe existing is a bunch of zeros. I think it's like 
a hundred or like 200 zeros that there would be life on earth. So there had to be a being here to fine tune that. Someone could argue that, oh, you know, the universe is very large. There are billions and billions of planets. So we just live in that one in a million possibility. And that's sort of a response to fine tuning argument. But historically, like until the modern day, classically and in the medieval period, Islamic theologians and like philosophers, they didn't really use that fine tuning argument. Right, but I'm saying atheists do. Yeah. So what would you respond to that? Well, our argument is based on causality, right? So our argument is based on this idea that, yeah, there are billions of planets, but all of those are contingent on the existence of something that's contingent on the existence of something. There has to be some wajib al-wajud, some necessary existent that brought everything to be. So that's how we would respond to that. We would say that, yeah, we'll concede that, right? We're not all that committed to a fine-tuning argument. But this argument of, of contingency and of a first cause... That's something that we are committed to. 